Good morning. <laughs> Welcome. It's bright and early. I appreciate you guys coming out this early uh, to the first session. Welcome to the DevNet Zone. My name's Matt DiNapoli. I'm the DevNet Systems Manager. Um, this is the first session we're doing this week, so welcome. Um, there are a couple of housekeeping items that I want to go over before I get started with the Coding 101 session. Um, new to the DevNet zone this year is something we're calling the DevNet Loot Scoot. Uh, what that is is a gamification of the whole DevNet zone. Um, you'll notice a screen right there. It has a QR code and a shortened URL. If you put that in, that'll um, send you to our DevNet Loot Scoot um, activity tracker page. And you'll notice there's an activity code at the bottom of that screen. If you type that code in, you'll get credit for attending this session. Um, if you uh, attend a number of sessions over the course of the week, um, you'll earn prizes at the, at the DevNet Loot Suit or Loot Scoot um, prize area. Um, and all the information for the DevNet Loot Scoot is found uh, within um, that site. So you'll see a menu that says Activity Tracker. That's where you'll, where you're, you'll put in the codes. Um, you'll see uh, where you can check your progress throughout the week, um, and you'll be able to also uh, find out more information about how we're tracking progress and things like that. So any of the sessions, demo pods, um, mini workshops, they'll have something like this, uh, where you just put in the activity code, and then all of our learning labs are also being tracked. So if you complete them, um, you'll automatically be given credit for those as well the first time you do it. Um, so each unique lab you'll get credit for. Um, so that's the DevNet Loot Scoot. Um, so please take part. You are required to have a Cisco.com user ID or a CCO ID uh, so we know who you are and can actually give you credit for it. Um, and then it also gives you um, credit and badges within Cisco communities as well. Um, so please take part. Um, we think it's, it'll be a lot of fun. It'll help you earn some prizes and some recognition within the DevNet Zone. So welcome. Um, I'm going to be going through uh, Coding 101. Um, I hope you guys can see the screen. This light, the sun is very strong right now, and I'm probably going to melt before the end of this presentation. But um, hopefully, we can get through it without me dying. <laughs> so um, let's uh, go through the agenda. Who's the session for? Um, this is for new coders, people who um, are realizing that the landscape is changing for network management and uh, realizing that we need to start building out applications. Um, and to build out applications, we have to actually write code. Um, it's for returning coders, people who maybe have moved into other positions, um, haven't been very close to uh, writing code in a long time. Um, net operations people, um, you guys have live in a world of configuration, uh, but uh, maybe haven't written code in the past. And really, these. Um, this session is really to give you a handle on uh, some of the basics around uh, using APIs, uh, how, they're, how they're leveraged, how you call them, how you get data from them. And then um, the other audience are DevOps. Um, you guys are probably a little more familiar with writing applications, but it doesn't hurt to learn about the APIs that uh, Cisco is providing into, the, into our platforms. So I, do, I should note that everything that I'm doing here is for learning and educational purposes. This is an actual uh, real structured code that you would write for an application. There are some uh, security things that we kind of skip over that uh, you wouldn't necessarily do um, in a real environment. Um, and then everything that I'm going over here, if, you, if it's, I go too fast or you're working on something and it doesn't quite work right, um, we have the learning labs, covers the exact same content. Um, uh, this particular session is covering uh, 101 and 102 in the learning labs. And then I believe uh, we have uh, 201 through 207 as well that expand on that information. Um, if you've gone through 101 and 102, uh, I would recommend kind of going in everything lockstep because each uh, successive lab builds on information that was pre uh, presented in the other. Um, or if you're feeling uh, particularly adventurous, maybe you'll jump ahead, but you might get a little lost. Um, we are going to be using browser. Um, we'll be using a, a REST client. Uh, we'll be looking at code in Python. Um, if you want to find out how to set up your uh, laptop for, to follow along with what I'm doing, um, all of that's covered in the Learning Labs. So if you go to learninglabs.cisco.com, click on uh, Coding 101, it'll say how to, how to set up your machine. And you can click on the links and download everything you need to do that there. 
Um, for this particular session, we're going to be using the APIC-EM Always On Sandbox. Um, we have a number of sandboxes on DevNet, uh, or the sandbox is part of DevNet. Um, APIC EM is one of them. Uh, we also cover things like collaboration technologies, uh, connected mobile experiences. And so what you can do is uh, register um, time for those sandboxes or go to a shared lab, and then you don't ex necessarily have to have the uh, VMs running on your local machines or the infrastructure running in your, in your lab. You can hit everything on our sandbox and start writing your applications there. Um, and then everything that I'm going to go through, all the code examples, they're found on GitHub under uh, Cisco DevNet. So actually, I will show you that real quick. Um, the coding skills sample code is just one of many repositories that we have up for uh, Cisco DevNet. So if you go to github.com, Cisco DevNet, um, we have all of our, some of our learning labs are up there, our coding uh, skills sample code, um, and then the 201 through 207 sample code as well. And actually a lot of our um, sample code for our different technologies is found here as well. So um, if you're interested in finding out more about some of the um, code that we already have built out for uh, interfacing with Cisco infrastructure, you can find that on under our Cisco DevNet GitHub repository. So let's kind of jump into it. Um, so what is a REST web service? Oh, let's start out, what is an actual web service? Um, and very simply, it's a way for two systems to communicate to each other. Um, we have a lot of different applications that might be running in the same environment. One application needs to know about information that's coming from another. This is just a way for them to talk to each other. Um, and if you guys are familiar, there are two major types of web services. Um, the, more widely used one that's coming, uh, that, that we're implementing now in a lot of our platforms is REST. Um, in the past, SOAP was used a little bit more often, but moving away from it, because it's a little more complicated than, um, than REST. So REST is an architectural style for designing networked applications. Um, and the nice thing about REST is that it's as easy as making an HTTP request. And so if you are trying to figure out how an API works, um, and it's a REST API, all you have to do is put the HTTP call in your browser window, or in your browser um, URL, and it'll spit back information. So, for example, we're using the AP, uh, sandbox, <coughs> we're using the uh, APIC-EM sandbox, and we'll get into this Postman client in a second, but um, if I wanted to just kind of play around and see what information came back from a particular API call, I could take that um, particular URL endpoint, pop that into my browser window, one second, hit enter, and it'll throw back information uh, from the API call. And we'll go through what some of this information means, how it's structured, That'll, we'll build on that as we go through this session. You aren't able to see? <laughs> I'm not sure what to do about that. <laughs> we are kind of in a sticky situation with the glare. <laughs> um, I'm sorry? Yes, I am. So can people see on this side? So it's, it's just as it tracks across. I'm not, I'm not sure what to do about that. <laughs> What's that? Oh, am I sharing on WebEx? No, I, I could. <laughs> All right, let me set up a WebEx meeting. <laughs> Wasn't a bad idea.
guys have caught me unprepared. <laughs> Don't look at my email. <laughs> oh, you can't see it anyway. <laughs> Here we go. So while we're waiting for that to load, um, are there any questions about REST or web services in general? No? OK, we're good there. Um, if you want to go to the meeting, I'll give you guys a second. Can you? Oh, you guys can't see it. So it's uh, cisco.webex.com/join/mdenapol. Uh, I'll give you guys a second to get on there. <laughs> it's uh, cisco.webex.com/join. slash M D E N A P as in Paul O L. And then I'm going to share everything that I'm doing. My screen. All right, I see a bunch of people joining. Excellent. Good idea. Who's, whose idea was that? <laughs> the WebEx idea. Excellent job. Thank you. <laughs> I, all right. Everyone relatively OK? OK, cool. <laughs> Thanks for standing by there. Um, <clears throat> so what is so great about REST? Um, it's very easy to use. Uh, you can build it into applications pretty quickly. Um, you'll see when we go through our uh, Python examples, when we put it into code, it's usually just a matter of importing a, a library that can help you make the requests and then putting in, building out the, um, the API string or the endpoint URL and then putting it into code and uh, hitting go. So <coughs> the APIC EM REST APIs, um, they provide you with a bunch of good information around um, the hosts, the devices, policies that um, you can configure for your network. So, one of the big things that you're going to want to become comfortable with as you start working with REST APIs is the documentation. And actually, the APIC EM documentation is very good. Um, it uses a tool called Swagger. And basically, what it provides you is information on the um, endpoint that you're going to call, the different types of parameters you can send, and the kind of information you're going to get back from those calls as well. So that when you are actually trying out these things, um, you meet that certain level of expectation while you're making those calls. So for example, um, if we look at the uh, host APIs, and look at the documentation around that. Taking a second to load here. There we go. If we if we want to get information about our hosts that are defined on the controller, it gives us a bunch of different opportunities to um, uh, try different endpoints. So, for example, the most simple one is just host, and the assumption is that 
if you just called this particular API, you would get all of the information back about every host on, uh, that's defined on that controller. So if we were to kind of quickly run that call, um, oh, I, I skipped ahead. Uh, the tool that we're looking at right here uh, is called Postman. There are a bunch of different REST clients. And you know, initially I'd said you can just, the easiest way is to just pop the API call into your uh, browser URL and you would get that information back. But tools like this allow you to see what's in the headers. It allows you to um, not just make get calls, but it allows you to actually post information through the APIs, um, do different activities like uh, delete, and we'll actually see uh, an example of that later. And so um, these kinds of tools are very good for allowing you to play with the APIs even more deeply than you could through your browser. So. Um, for example, if we were to call the host API directly, um, and the APIC-EM sandbox is set up without any security, so I'm not gonna get into authentication and things like that. Some of the more complicated items are, are around authenticating users to use the APIs. You can imagine some of the challenges that you would run into if you did not put security around your API calls, especially if you're allowing users to make changes to information, and we'll see some examples later around creating policies that actually block ports. And um, if you allowed people to do that uh, without security, that would be a terribly bad idea. <laughs> so, uh, but we ran this particular API call, and uh, we get information back in a format called JSON. Um, APIC-EM's uh, default uh, standard is JSON when sending information back. Um, the other one that's used uh, depending on the product is XML. But usually the way uh, APIs are built, you can tell it if you want XML versus JSON, and it's just different ways of formatting the data as it comes back. It's the same data, it just looks a little different. So um, the one that we're going to focus on today is JSON. Um, so we see that we got a bunch of information back about hosts um, when we made that call. Now, <coughs> if we wanted to then Say we only wanted a certain set of hosts. Um, does the API allow us to do that? I don't know. Let's check out the documentation. So, okay, we can get host and network device. Oh, there's this host start index records to return. What does that look like? It sends us a list of hosts. I can identify the index that I want to start at. And then let's say I only wanted two of these um, records to be sent back to me. I could do that as well. And so it tells me that I can send it to the endpoint with host, and then usually with the documentation, your parameters that you can send are in curly brackets. So if we were to go back to Postman and run that, that one, um, let's say we wanted to start at one and we only wanted two of these, we could change that. Um, hit send. And then it comes back, and now instead of, I think we had four or five previously, and now we only have two. So um, the documentation then tells me that I have the opportunity to make those calls and changes um, based on uh, the, what I actually want to do. So the documentation itself is really good at helping you figure out what the capabilities are of the API. Um, so if you wanted to set up a loop and you wanted to go through all the devices but you didn't know how big the loop was, you might do something like get host count. And so, um, but you can see there's no parameters around it. It's a very simple API that would just send us back the, the number of devices, so, or the number of hosts. So if we were to, again, just real quickly go in and make that change. Okay, we have four in there, so. Um, any questions around just kind of generally using the documentation, making API calls, any particular items on Postman yet? Now, we've only done gets. We're gonna move into um, actually adding data through the API and then deleting data through the API um, as we move forward. So, just wanna make sure we cover all our bases here. Okay, we will, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a policy. So we'll start with just getting policies so you see what that looks like. And then we'll add in a policy 
and you can see how that'll then show up in the list when we call it back again. So if we go to back to Postman, um, you'll notice that um, instead of this get, I've now changed this to post, and this means that I'm telling the server, I want to change, in, I want to add information. Um, if you were doing a put, you might be changing information that already exists. Um, and then the other one we're going to talk about is delete, and that's obviously removing information. Um, so very straightforward CRUD operations um, covered in the REST client and in the APIs themselves. So if we were to do a post um, of, say we wanted to add a new policy to our controller. Um, what we need to do is call the API, but we also need to provide it with a payload. And that payload has to be in JSON. And so um, I'm going to run through a couple of error scenarios uh, so that you can see what happens when um, you don't quite fill out everything properly in the, API, or in the REST client. So I'm just sending text. I haven't set any headers. And what I should get here is an error saying that did it run? Yeah, so I got a server error, 500 server error, the error code unknown, and it tells me that I can't send um, plain text to the, um, to the APIC EM controller. So I'm like, okay, well, how do I fix that? Um, first of all, there are some fun tools that you can use, and one of them is called JSON Lint. And there are actually a number of Lint tools um, if you just are working in something and there's XMLint, there's, um, I was using JavaScript, I was writing some JavaScript the other day and I needed to figure out if I'd format it correctly and um, I was, so I was using JSLint. Uh, but JSONLint's very useful. Uh, you just basically take the um, text that you are working with, pop it into the window, hit validate, and then it tells me that it's valid. The nice thing is it also cleans it up, it pretties it up so you can read it more easily, takes, uh, gives it the right indentation, all those things that um, you, you know, you're gonna wanna uh, have in place to make it a little more readable. So I'm gonna take this uh, formed JSON, and then the other thing that we need to do is we're sending a post, but we haven't actually told the server that uh, this is JSON content that we're sending it. So in the, um, in the header, we're gonna want to uh, set up content type, and this particular one is application JSON. And I believe this should work. 202 accepted, great. Now, with the APIC EM controller, what it does is it says, OK, thanks for this information. I have to do some work. I'm going to set a task ID. You can come back and check what's going on with that task ID. So if we take our task ID, we'll dump that into a text file, just so we have it for reference. And now I want to see, maybe, I, maybe I'm really anxious about the, if this policy got created or not. What I, what I want to do is um, check the task. And so let's go back to our documentation real quickly and see what we can do with the task API. If we go to, again, available APIs, I see there's tasks there. OK. Let that load. Very simple API. It's just looking up information. Um, oh, I have the task ID. I can look up what's going on if I, if I put that into the API call. So if we go into our um, Postman client again, we see that, sorry, I had to make it big so you guys could see it on the screen, but it also makes it a little challenging because we're on the WebEx as well. But you see that I'm calling um, the task endpoint, but now I'm gonna put in the task that I just copied. And it should, I'm guessing since I talked a little bit, that um, it should say it was either completed or there was some error for some reason. So it's actually going out and getting that information right now. I'm missing a what? Oh, I didn't copy it properly? Communication error. There you go. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so this task, 
the policy creation failed. Um, it's telling me there's a parcel success because uh, I didn't actually activate the policy, but it actually has the record in the, um, it has the policy record within the service. So if we wanted to actually check the policy, um, this is the policy ID. And if we wanted to look at that, again, if you want to go back to the, um, to the documentation and see, can I look up policy by ID? Yeah, you can make the assumption that's probably, sure, probably the case. But just to be sure, let's check out the policy docs. Go to policy. There's a lot more operations, so it takes a little while. OK, I can call policy by ID, and that will give me information about that specific policy. So if we go back to Postman and look up policy, do this. So now we see that I put uh, the policy exists as a record in, in the server. Um, coding 101, Cisco Live US2, that we knew that was the one that I just created. It states inactive. Um, I'm sure there's an API to activate it, uh, but we don't need to get into that today. So now let's say I want to actually delete this policy. Excuse me. <clears throat> Pretty straightforward. Um, since we just got it, we can delete it. And Hit send. Two or two accepted. Now again, we got a task ID because the APIM controller has got to do a little work to get rid of that policy. If we want to check that task, we can go in there. Policy deleted successfully, hooray. So if I was to go back and actually try to look that policy up, I should get an error because now it's gone. Oh, that was the, yeah, so it was deleted successfully. So it's not an error, but it tells me that it was actually deleted. So um, that was kind of a quick tutorial on using the REST clients to make different calls and then interacting with the documentation to become familiar with the APIs that are available to you and the different uh, ways you can make the calls, sending parameters, different headers, things like that. Are there any questions around that before I move on? Because I'm going to now move on from using those, these tools to make API calls to actually putting this in code. Good? Good. Okay. Actually, if you wanted to ask a question, since we're on WebEx, <laughs> um, you can pop it into the chat window, and we can process it that way so you guys don't have to scream. So if that sounds good to you. OK. Um, again, setting up your Python environment. If you have a Mac, it's pre-installed. Um, I think it actually has the requests library that we're going to be using um, already installed. If not, um, it's a matter of just typing a quick command, uh, I think, pip and then it, um, requests will install it. Uh, Windows is a little bit trickier. It's not um, installed uh, natively, so you have to install it. But, <clears throat> excuse me, it's uh, very easy to do. And then you can go through these tutorials um, pretty directly, all covered in learninglabs.cisco.com, coding 101. So basically, we'll, we'll jump into the code and uh, become familiar with what's going on. The first file that we're going to look at is the APIC-EM Hello World. Um, so we're going to be using the requests library. And what that does is it makes it very easy for us to um, make the API call. Um, there are some other uh, tools or libraries that allow you to do this. Um, I think the other one that is at the top of mind is called URL lib. does a similar thing, but it basically defines um, the uh, the methods that you can um, put the API call into to actually have it go out, have your application go out, make the call, and then bring the data back. So um, makes it a lot easier than having to do all the code behind the scenes. Uh, so that's what we're going to use for this. Um, this APIC-EM Hello World uh, file runs on its own. 
Um, if we walk through the code, uh, we're setting a variable called controller to the sandbox apic.cisco.com controller, so the one we were using with the uh, REST client. Um, and then this time we want to get network devices. So we're just building out an API string call. Uh, so we're building on the controller, we're building the get devices URL, we're concatenating the controller with um, the API call, network device, and then like we did with the hosts, we're starting at index one, but we want to get three results back. Um, so uh, if we were to look at the documentation for the request package, they'll tell us that there is a method called get, and then you send in the uh, get devices URL, so that string that we just built, and then um, this verify equals false is actually a verification of an SSL certificate. If you were writing a real application, you would not do this. It would always be true. <laughs> um, and then basically all we're going to do is just print out that list of devices. And so let's see what that looks like. Uh, I was making sure that all the code worked because that would have been embarrassing if it didn't, right? So the first one, um, to run a Python uh, application, type py, and then the name of the file. So cool. We got a bunch of uh, information about the network devices that are set up on this particular controller. Um, it's kind of a mishmash of information. If you knew what you were looking at, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, then maybe this would make a little bit of sense. You can see some of the elements of the JSON that we saw earlier, uh, some of the curly brackets, and the quotation marks around each individual attribute. So for the most part, the data is there. It just doesn't look that good. We're going to make it look good. So the next step along the path is to head into the um, APIC EM1.py file. A um, little bit of a, a change to what we did previously. Um, we are building out the entire URL, importing requests, and actually might have done this out of order, but either way, it's, it'll show you what we're doing within the code. Um, and all we're doing, again, is just printing out the information. So this one, um, the difference between, oh, we are getting the hosts instead of the network devices. So that's why it was a, a different set of information. Um, where it starts getting interesting is in the Learning Lab Basics uh, file. So this time now we're going to take the actual JSON and manipulate it a little bit so it looks a little better. Um, so similar to the APICM Hello World file, um, we're importing requests. Um, we always need to bring that library in. Uh, but now we're importing JSON. And that gives us, it's a library that gives us the opportunity to um, manipulate the JSON that's coming back print it up on our screen so that it's, uh, parse it and print it up on our screen so that it looks like something that we can read or your application can read. Um, again, the control URL, the same thing that we saw before. And then now we're uh, going back to getting network devices, um, everything that you had seen previous to that, sending the res uh, request. And then the difference now is that we're actively saying to the application, all right, I'm getting JSON back. I want you to do something with it. And we're putting that into a, uh, this get devices JSON variable. And then because it knows it's JSON, we then have an opportunity to um, call a uh, function called json.dumps. And it allows us to send in the information that we're getting back from the call, the get devices uh, JSON, tells us uh, how many indentations we want at each level of information. Um, and then the uh, separators for each record. So um, this gives us a little more control over the information that's coming back from our call. Uh, there's a question. What's that? What's that? Oh, good, good question. Uh, we'll, I'll get to that one second. So the question was, um, where do you get the headers in Postman? Um, you're saying on the call back, on the information back? OK, yeah, we can get to that. All right. So let me run through this, and then I'll, I'll jump back. Um, the question uh, that I didn't cover in the, showing the REST client is, sometimes there's information in the headers, if, especially if you get an error that's kind of important. 
Um, and I'll show you guys real quickly where you can see that within the REST client. Um, but we'll run this example uh, quickly. So, learninglandbasics.py. So, we saw all that information come back. Now it's cleaned up a little bit. It's a little bit easier to read. Um, gives us information about the devices. It tells us what the devices are. Um, but still very raw information. It's giving us all of the, um, all of the JSON back that, um, that is defined within the API. Uh, it's, you know, maybe you don't need all this information. So we're going to see in the next few steps how to cull that down to things that are actually useful to you at that point in time. So um, then uh, I'm going to answer his question real quick, and then we'll get back into that. So if we look at the Postman client, um, if you're concerned about maybe an error status, so let's say we, uh, so this one was successful. If we actually click on the headers tab, it'll tell you information that came back. 200 OKs, um, that means everything worked out as you expected, so there's not usually a ton of information within there. Um, and depending on the API, they might give you more information for things like, so for, oh, this is a great example. Um, for our DevNet Loot Scoot, we're, in a, uh, we're integrated with uh, Bunchball, which is a gamification platform. And they have a, a defined APIs that we're using to track the codes and do all that information. But they rate limit how often you can use the APIs. And so in each call, in their headers, they define that rate limit so that if you hit it, um, you can give, give it a, a second in your application and then let people then uh, start trying to use it again. So those kinds of things can be found in the headers. And then um, if, let's see if we can create an error situation here. This one's not particularly. Oh, so APKEM is actually handling the errors. Let's see if we, yeah, that's, uh, let's just hit an endpoint that doesn't exist. <laughs> let's say I mistyped task. 404 not found. Um, but anyways, that's where, the, that's where the headers are if you're looking at that. Uh, if you're looking at the REST client, it's underneath the information that comes back. Did that answer your question? So, so, we can talk afterwards. <laughs> um, so where were we? Oh, okay, so now moving on uh, to Learning Lab Basics Step 2. Um, again, import requests, import JSON. This is the controller we're hitting, all the same stuff. Um, and then where it changes a little bit here, is that uh, we're going to actually call out the information that we want and display just those pieces of data that, um, that we're interested in in this particular period of time. And so the thing that we're looking for is the type of device um, because um, we don't need, so if we went back and we looked at, we don't need host name, we don't need no location name, we don't need the role source. All we care about is the type. And so, so we want it to spit out this information only, okay? So what we're looking at for each item that comes in, so for each device that we find in that JSON response, um, we want to print out the ID number and then the type that it is. So let's actually see that in action. So cool, we have three, we asked for three devices, we got three back, we have their IDs, and the type of devices that they are. Now, yes? On the actual platform? Um, I don't know enough about the product to answer that question intelligently, <laughs> so I don't know. The question was, does the, the device list uh, persist beyond reboots? Oh, the IDs? Yeah. Um, so I don't know that. I can find that out and get back to you. 
Any other questions around the code, though? No? OK. Um, so again, building on top of what we just did, skip over all that, request JSON, controller URL, all the same stuff. Cool. We're, we're used to that. That's old hat, right? So now what we want to do is print the network device ID. But then we want to get the, um, actually what we're going to do here is get the network devices, print the IDs out for those, get the hosts, print it. So now what we're doing is we're getting all the information back from the controller, making multiple calls um, through the requests library and printing all that information out so we can see it. So you can see we're putting out the ID for the devices. OK, made that call, great. Now we're making the call to the host URL. Great. Um, getting that JSON back, printing out the hosts, and the host IP addresses. Um, and then we're going to look at the policies and do the same thing. ID on the policies, applications. And so you'll see that the structure of the code is very similar for each section that we're, that we're working on. Um, the the uh, URL that we're going to send in the request is built with the controller URL plus the, or concatenated with the specific endpoint that we want. So policy, host, network device. Um, and then you'll see as we go through it, it'll list all of them, skip a step, and then, um, or put in a space, and then uh, add the next list as we go down. So um, let's see how that works. Got our devices. Now it's making the next call. We have our IP addresses for our hosts. Next call, IDs for our policies. And then I think applications is next. So these are the applications that are defined with on the controller. Um, wait, just got a question in. Are there, are the test uh, Python somewhere for us to look at later? Yes. Um, who asked that question? Raise your hand. OK, thank you. Uh, so the question was, are the test files uh, available to look at later? They're all, everything that I'm going through is in the learning labs. Uh, coding 101 and 102 are covered um, in this session. Um, actually, if you guys came in late, um, we're, you know, it's, it's pretty crowded. We're doing this exact same session in 20 minutes, and I think it's classroom one, but Mandy's going to teach it, and she's way better at it than me. So I would recommend if you're like, oh, I totally missed it, Mandy's just Top notch, so you guys picked the wrong one. So, <laughs> but we see we got the, that information back from the, uh, from the application call. So, um, what was the next step? Oh, so now we know how to get information, that's all fine and good, but maybe we wanna make changes. Maybe you're building a uh, web application that uh, manages all of the configuration on the controller and you need to actually add devices or add policies. Um, we're going to actually look at creating uh, that policy in code. So we saw that we did that with the uh, JSON client, but what does that actually mean when we're putting in code? And so uh, we'll walk through the code for creating a policy, and then because I don't want to leave um, a bunch of uh, test information on the controller, we're going to delete it as well. So this is where things get a little more complicated, and I'll walk through the code and then um, we can run it. We can walk through it again if you guys want to, uh, just to make sure that it's kind of understood what's going on for each step. Um, the idea for this is that we're going to get the information for the policies initially, um, check the count, add one in, and then make sure that we added it by making sure the count incremented by one. So um, I should note, if you're following along with this, um, we're going to hit a situation where we need to um, add the policy. <coughs> I would recommend um, changing the policy owner information and the port number to something, I mean, try to pick something random. If you get an error on, the, um, on that, it means it already exists, which means someone here probably or in the learning labs uh, picked the same number you did. So uh, we don't really have a good way of keeping that from happening right now for this particular uh, for this particular class, but uh, just keep trying different numbers. <laughs> so I wanted to mention that before we get into actually running the code. So if we look at the code again, um, again, we're very familiar with these top three lines. Um, 
We're also we're getting the host information again, uh, putting out putting that. Um, and the reason we're getting the host, I should say, the reason we're getting the host information is we're going to create a policy against the host, and we want to make sure that we're creating a policy against the host that exists. So that's why we're uh, doing this initially, uh, getting the getting the hosts, and then iterating through them to uh, make sure we pull one that we can create a policy against. Um, and then it'll, we'll print out and say this is the selected host. And then um, we're going to grab our policies count, so API v0 policy um, uh, slash count, to make sure that when we add our policy that that number is incremented by one. Um, so we do our requests. Um, set the count that comes back, and then we print that out. Total number of policies before, concatenate that with the count. Um, so now we're going to, so we, now we're going to get a list of policies. This is kind of just for show. <laughs> um, we want to print the list of policies before we add the new one. Um, again, something we've seen before, controller URL concatenated with the policy, and then, um, uh, we're, so the, we are using the count, though, this time. So we're starting at index one, and we're getting all of the policies that are coming back. You could do this uh, both ways uh, by either setting the index and, and the number of uh, r records you want back. This is kind of just for show. If you wanted all the policies, you would just say, uh, just send me the policies. You wouldn't actually put the, the start and index, or the index in the, um, the start and index in. So then we print out the list of policies. Um, as we do that, so we're not just getting the JSON, we're actually pulling out the IDs and the policy name. And then um, now, now we're getting into creating the new policy. Um, I'm going to say the policy owner is me. Um, the selected host is the one that we actually grabbed up here. So just so you guys can see that. Um, remember, we were talking about getting the host. We want to make sure that we, get, that we set the policy against the host that exists. Otherwise, we'll get an error. Um, if we go to selected host, we're setting that variable um, to the, uh, I believe, I think Python indexes starting at one. So this might be the second one. If it's not, then it's the third one. Um, and it's grabbing the host IP address for that particular selected host and setting that to the selected host variable. So then we see that in use down as we're creating our um, payload, our JSON payload to send into the create request. So we have the selected host set as the user identifier. And then uh, now we're setting the port uh, on the application that we want to block. Um, so I'm just going to pick uh, 13. 97. Hopefully that works. And then knock Mandy's name out of there because she's not teaching a class. And the other thing that you're wanting to do with a create, they're a little more complicated. You're want to set the headers. So we had seen in the um, when we went through the Postman client, we set the headers for the content type when we did the creation to application JSON. Uh, we're going to want to do the same thing when we do it in code. So we set a, a header variable, same thing that we did within the REST client. Um, we're setting our URL. And then um, now, this is, now we're actually making the call. But instead of doing a dot .get, we're doing a dot .post. So that's the big difference here is that we're actually changing uh, the activity that we're doing against, this, against the service. So, Everything that we see in here, the create policy URL, okay, that's APIC sandbox or sandbox APIC EM .com, concatenated with the policy. Um, the data that we're sending is the payload that we built. So um, that payload up here that I just made some changes to, and then the headers are equals headers. So, and if you were to look at the documentation for post, it would tell you, all right, these are the things that you can send, these are the things that are required, these are the things that are optional. So it tells us that if we use the request package and the post method within it, that's what you need. You need a policy URL, you need a payload, and you need headers. 
and then we're going to print out the result of the create. And then um, we'll actually, let's run that, and then I'll, we can see what the result is, because you can see that now we're getting into processing the task ID like I did with the REST client. Um, we're getting into a situation where then we're checking the policies um, that count for them until we get that number incremented by one. Hopefully we created one correctly. Um, and then the policies after. So um, I'm gonna run this and then we can kind of look at the code at what happens after we create the policy. That was Learning Lab create policy. Okay, it's going through. All right, so that happened a little quickly, but we can walk through what happened. So we ran the application. We picked a host uh, 40.0.0.15, total number of policies before 43, and it gives us the list, right, of the ones, of the policies that we've set up. And so we don't see ours in there because we haven't created it yet. But uh, we, it's not showing in the actual output, but we made the request to create the policy. The result of the create then is spit out and it gave us our task ID. And then it's telling us that the task progress is create. And then it waited. And then the total number of policies after adding the new one is 44. Great, that means that our policy was created successfully. And then it should show up in this list. Um, if it was created successfully. What did I call it? Learning Lab Matt 101. I'm missing it. <laughs> Let's go back to the REST client and see. Oh, you're right. I didn't save it. Thank you. That's right, it put Mandy's in there. There it is. Let's try it again. Thank you very much. <laughs> there we go. So there it shows up. Thank you. So just jumping into the code then. Um, we had created the policy. And then now we're checking policies after creating the new one. Let's see, sorry, trying to find my spot here. So we were checking on the status of the create policy operation. So that was this particular output, result of create, task progress. Um, that's showing up here. And then we're then building out to check to make sure that the policy was actually added. So we see that it's in, in, incremented by one. Total number of policies after adding the new one. We saw that that went from 44 to 45. And then, um, and then gives us the list of policies after adding that new one. And prints them out with the ID and the policy name. So um, it looks like uh, in some instances people aren't going through the delete policy. <laughs> but this is a lot uh, more straightforward. Um, a simple example, I'm going to delete this policy, but you can see that we are actively putting in the ID for that policy. What you may do in a situation is if you were building an application, you'd have a drop-down box that had all the policy IDs, click on that, hit delete, and it would, um, you would do it that way instead of hard coding it into the code. Um, that's not particularly useful, but for example purposes, it gives you an idea of um, how you can do that. Um, the big thing to call out here is that the method is called delete, very similar to what you would expect um, in the REST client. Um, so we saw in the REST client get post delete. In the code, we saw get post delete. So the request library makes it very straightforward um, as far as uh, tying in line to how the APIs are used and the different methods you can use with them. So we're going to delete that, make sure it got deleted, and, um, and then print that out. 
So the ID for my particular um, mark We're going to put that in to here. And then what should happen, I'm going to save the file this time so it deletes my particular ID. And this is Learning Lab delete policy. Policy deleted successfully. So very straightforward example of how to create a policy and then remove it within the code using the REST APIs. So um, I know we only have about five more minutes. Does anyone have any questions about the things we went over, questions about the tools we used, um, where to get more information? All right. So um, everything that we did is kind of covered within these references. It's covered very in very good detail in the learning labs. Um, I would recommend checking them out if there were certain things that you missed um, or certain things that weren't clear. And then if you want to move forward and um, build on those, go. So this covered 101 and 102 in the learning labs. Go on to the 201s through 207s. Um, there's also some sessions this week that cover um, that area as well. Um, logging, parsing of data, that kind of stuff. Um, but it builds on the things that we did here. And again, if you came late in five minutes, Mandy's doing the same exact thing um, over in the other, uh, over in the classroom. So I would recommend checking that out if, if there were some things that you missed at the beginning. Um, please uh, take advantage of the Loot Scoot, um, the activity codes at the bottom of the screen. You can scan that URL or scan that QR code or URL to take you to the activity tracker that I mentioned at the beginning and um, then you'll get credit for attending this session. All the sessions, demo pods have that Loot Scoot um, uh, available to you, so you get uh, credit for doing all of the things in the DevNet Zone. So if there aren't any other questions, I'm done here. And, oh, yes, one more. Um, I need to check on that, I don't know. Uh, I think we might be posting them to our community site, but um, I'll make sure in following sessions that's, that's addressed. <laughs> So the question was, how do we get the presentation for this? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, I didn't find out if we had a repository for it. They might all be available on the Cisco Live site. They're usually pretty good about doing that, but we'll, they're not. Okay, so we'll, we'll post them. We'll post them somewhere, um, and we'll make that available. The info desk will know at some point in the next hour or so. Okay, cool. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate your time.